So let's start this morning. If you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 10 to sort of set up the third message that I want to share with you on the Lord's Prayer. I mentioned in the very beginning and the very first message that I had been reading all of December and I've been doing it, continuing it in January. I read the Sermon on the Mount every day. Three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. takes about 20 minutes or so to read it. And the more you read something like that, the, the more it soaks into your spirit. It's, it's a wonderful experience. And out of it, I realized that the Sermon on the Mount is impossible to fulfill and walk in. You, there's no way that you can do it. How can you stay salty? How do you always shine? How, how can you be more righteous than other people, specifically the Pharisees? How do you go through all day... <clears throat> And live up to Matthew 6, where Jesus says, You've heard it said in the Old Testament, but I say unto you, and he elevates, raises the bar on the Ten Commandments and, and all of the commands of the Old Testament, such as, you know, uh, you heard that adultery is wrong. I say, if you even look at a woman, you're dead in your tracks. How do you keep your eye clear and looking focused? How do you keep from hypocrisy? How do you bear good fruits? How do you always forgive? How do you build on the rock? Man, those are all impossible things. I know, maybe you're better at it than I am, but I find those challenging. Matthew chapter 10, I'm going to just read a few verses out of there. This is where Jesus sends the 12 out to minister. Verse 5, it's from the New American Standard Bible. These 12 Jesus sent out, After instructing them, jump down to verse 7, As you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leopards, cast out demons, freely you've received, freely give. Well, that would have been enough to stop me right there. I said, I'm not sure I'm going to sign up for this posse, and I'm going to be going and doing those things. This is a challenge. A lot of people look at this and they go, well, that was just for the apostles. That that it's not for today. If my history is correct about the Pentecostal movement, we are a Pentecostal church. I love what Daryl said today. Let me see, I wrote it down. Preach, teach, and model, model Pentecostal. Preach, teach, model. That's right, somebody said Pentecostal got that from Ron Prinzing. And unfortunately, many of the churches that have their roots in Pentecostalism, the baptism of the Spirit, the moving in the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, uh, the signs of the Spirit, signs and wonders, seems to have been two different things. It's either uh, not happening anymore, or it's put in a different context and it's moved to another room, another place, or it's discounted completely. So many discount those signs and wonders and say they're not for today. Some kind of poo-poo them, put them aside. And this is even in Pentecostal churches. Because it's not very attractive, according to some, it's not very seeker-friendly to have a Pentecostal experience in the Sunday morning service. I can tell you, if if we wheeled in a casket next Sunday and prayed over it, and somebody came out of that casket, the following Sunday you couldn't get into this place. Right? But I'm perplexed with this as you are. I love preaching the kingdom of heaven. I love praying for the sick. I've not raised anybody from the dead. I've not even prayed for anybody to be raised from the dead. I don't run into lepers too often, but I do run into people that have different diseases. And we have had experience, Judy and I, with casting out demons. 
uh, when we were pastoring Calvary Chapel of San Pedro, come up here. When we were pastoring Calvary Chapel of San Pedro, we had you've you've heard my version of my tugboat and Annie story. I'm going to let Judy give you her version of this. But there was a street lady there. We were meeting down in, in the in the harbor section in a in a storefront <coughs> storefront. And this lady was obviously demon possessed. Uh, kind of hung around our congregation a lot. And one Sunday, I wasn't looking. I was standing at the door, and she came up and slugged me. And it took six policemen to to arrest this lady. And she slugged me, knocked me flat on my face. You tell them what happened next. Wow. And speak real loud. Needless to say, we were all in prayer. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of a be instant in season. I, I This is a big surprise. Um, what happened next, uh, after she knocked Mike to the ground, she then came up to me. And the Holy Spirit within me said... Fix your eyes on her. Don't turn your head. Because I just saw what happened to Mike. Because he accidentally he looked away from her, and that's when she hit him. So when I looked at her in the eye, I could see the enemy just staring right back. And uh, so, you know, we're nothing without the Lord and without the Holy Spirit. We're fair game without the covering of the Lord. And so um, I took authority over the enemy. And I was praying in tongues while she was saying nonsensical things to me and just staring at me like she was going to hit me. And I prayed against that possibility. (laughs) But keeping up in prayer in the Holy Spirit, she began to look away and then eventually she started backing up and then because this was at the door of the church she was she had been in the church and first of all she had been in the church before any of that happened to Mike and she was saying bad things bad words and Mike said you're welcome to be here but not if you use bad words you can't stay And so she used a lot more bad words after that. And uh, she went outside, and Mike was with her. And so that's what happened there. But anyway, she started backing up, and she ended up going to the back to the corner of the building, and then she turned around and walked backwards and walked away. So the Holy Spirit is full of power. Amen. All power and authority in Jesus' name to do whatever it is we ask of him and we pray in his will. So I want to encourage each of you, if you ever have anything, anybody come up to you, you know, we first of all, I know you'll pray. I know you will pray and take authority over the enemy and pray for the love of Jesus to shower the person. That's easy enough to do. God's love is wonderful, isn't it? Thank you. So I'm laying on the ground, and I turn around, and here's my wife in the middle of the street. I bind you in the name of Jesus. She's got her hand up like that, and I happen to look, then I turn my head and I saw... Tugboat and Annie moving back down the street. When the police came and arrested her, because I was a ride-along chaplain at the time, they came back and told me, you know what, first time ever when we found her on a porch and she was sound asleep, no resistance, and we took her to jail. So this verse, Matthew chapter 10 Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leprous, cast out demons. Freely you receive, freely give. Verse 16, Behold, I send send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Verse 20, For it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks. Verse 29, And 
uh, are not two sparrows sold for a cent? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Verse 38. And he who does not take up his cross. Now the Luke version has daily. Take up his cross and follow after me. He's not worthy of me. So Father, I ask you to bless this uh, teaching this morning in the Lord's Prayer with the backdrop of the, of the so many impossible things that you've called us into. And yet they are the things of the normal walk that you have for us as believers. Make it normal here. Make it normal in our lives. Help us to preach the gospel of this kingdom, to heal, to pray for those who are in, uh, near death or death, to take authority over the principalities and powers and the demons that would be around us. Because, Lord, freely you gave to us, freely we need to give it away. So from your handout, i got a big word up there, the kingdom of God, eschatological or present. The word eschatology refers to the future. Now, I grew up, went to seminary, and pastored in a, tr- in a church which pretty much relegated the, the, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, to that which is future. To that which is future. And it's true, the kingdom of God is future. We just <laughs> sang about it. We're all happy when we get to heaven. And yet, the... Sermon on the Mount solidifies in the middle through the Lord's Prayer about the presence of the kingdom here on this earth. Now, there's been abuses of this in the Pentecostal and charismatic movements, but there's a theological distinction that needs to be made that the kingdom of heaven is here now, and part of our ministry is seeing the presence of heaven invade people's lives. So let's look at the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, it's on the right of your handout, hallowed be the, your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then the section I want to focus on a little bit today, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So on the left-hand side, I've listed some of what I talked about last Sunday. You can review that uh, uh, at your own leisure. I'm not going to go over all of that. I just want to make sure that we all understand that the kingdom of heaven was birthed when Jesus the Messiah came to this earth. There was no king of the kingdom on the earth until he came. It was all set up from the very beginning of God making us in his image, and then uh, we fell out of the garden. Uh, Abraham was given the purpose and the vision that in his seed there would be one who would bless everyone who blessed them meaning all Gentiles and Jews alike. So the picture of the tabernacle and the temple from the Old Testament foreshadows what was there when Jesus came. When his birth as a child and the angels sang out glory to God in the heaven and then fast forward to the resurrection, when he rose from the dead, it truly birthed the presence and the power of the kingdom of God here. Now, here now. You and I who are part of a universal church, everyone that is a believer, born again believer in Jesus Christ is a part of that church. We have the authority to call down heaven. Well, let me put it this way. How many of you feel that there in heaven, do you think there's sickness? No. Do you think there's hurricanes? No. There are not those things. I mentioned this last Sunday. I need to repeat it again. And so when in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says to us, 
pray, Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. It sets up the direction of our prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as we pray for people, we're praying for the presence of the kingdom to come. Now, in the area of healing especially, in the early days of Pentecost, it was a major portion of the, of the moving of the, of the movement that we belong to as an, as an assembly of God church. Wonderful miracles. Many of those are still going on. They don't seem to be as present as evident across denomin- Pentecostal denominations as they used to be. And part of that, I think, is because we've, we've been swallowed up in the condition of the world. The other problem is it's a lot easier to call 911. It's a lot easier to go to the doctor when I have a problem. It's a lot easier to do those things than it is to engage in spiritual warfare and prayer. Prayer is hard work. It's hard work. Judy and I have been in a battle in the, for the last 24 hours. Can I share this? I guess, I guess you will. I guess I will. I made the mistake. Oh, what a confession this is. So she was complaining about something and I thought the Lord said, this is a test for me, not for her. And I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to use Judy as, as my test. Well, man, she kept getting sicker and sicker and sicker as the day went on. And yesterday it was horrible. So in the past, as a matter of fact, we were thinking of calling 911. We were making preparation, getting the dog fed, and getting the clothes out and all that stuff. I said, wait a minute, I am not going to give up that easy. I'm just not going to give up that easy. And uh, so I was in there every 45 minutes to an hour, it seemed like. I'm anointing the places on her body with oil that were giving her distress. And she's crying out in pain. And I'm laying my hands on her and praying over her. And every time that I prayed, and you can verify, every time I prayed, the pain seemed to go down. Okay. The only problem was I'm going to have to stay in there for 24 hours, seven days a week uh, for a week before, you know, if that's going to be the case. Sometimes I think we just give up too easy. We give up too, we stop praying too quick. Why is that? Because we've seen so many people not healed. We say, oh, don't say amen. I know what you mean. I love Robert. So we see more people not healed than healed. That becomes discouraging after a while. We have our Friday once a month prayer meetings. I used to dread them. Our healing meetings. Once a month on a Friday we have a heal, And I would dread those meetings. Why do I dread them? Because I'm expected to be the pastor and people are supposed to get healed. Nobody ever gets healed. Why do you keep perpetuating something that isn't working? And yet Jesus said, go, preach the kingdom, heal the sick. How am I supposed to do it? Well, we know part of the pat answer was Jesus doing the healing, it's not me. But i got to tell you, folks, he uses you and I as a vessel. The last thing he said in Matthew 28, all power, all authority is given to me. Now, he gave us the authority. Don't have the time to connect those dots, but he gave us the authority and he told the disciples, wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to come, Acts chapter 2. Because you, having authority is one thing, but having the power to exercise the authority is another thing. You need both of those in sequence to work. So the authority to cast out demons and the authority to stand against the enemy, the authority to pray for healing. When the baptism of the Spirit came, and I believe it's a 
specialized thing that every believer needs to receive separate from salvation or at salvation. We will become witnesses. And as you read the whole text of Acts, the witness was not just for salvation. It was for raising people from the dead. It was for healing. You read the book of Acts. It takes everything that Jesus did in the Gospels and translates them into the present power of what the church is supposed to have. And yet there's many teachers today that says oh, that are cessationists believe all those gifts and all those things passed away. And, and so you're left with an impotent church. If, it got, if it's God's will, we pray that uh, so, so and so gets raised up. Now, in this congregation, this is a congregation of seniors. I remember when I came here when I was 48 years old, two years after we were here, I came up with the slogan, you're never too old to be healed. Now that I'm 75, I don't know about that. <laughs> you're never old, too old to, and then you fill in the blank. What are you never too old to do? You're never too old to pray for people. You're never too old to witness to people. You're never too, you're never too old to see God heal people. You're never too old to be healed yourself. I got Mabel over here, a hundred years old. She's never too old. She says, "Don't remind me." God gave us the Lord's Prayer, or Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer, to encourage us that we weren't left without power and authority. We weren't left defenselessness, defenseless. We weren't left with the tools to extend the kingdom of God. Are you two guys related? Mother, daughter? Yes. Yeah. So you're you're never too old. And that's kind of a word for you too. You're never too old to receive what you can give away. Let me say it again. You're never too old to receive something to give away. But we reach an age where we stop receiving. Because we think we've received everything. We don't have that expectancy that I think is revealed in the next verse. Verse 11 of the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread. How many of you ate breakfast this morning? See your hands. It's not a trick question, okay? Okay. How, how many are, go, are you going to have lunch? <laughs> how many are fasting? <laughs> so we have learned to eat every day because our body needs that nourishment every day. The question for us when we see this prayer, most of the theo theologians and commentators divide the Lord's Prayer in half. And they put verse 9, 10, 9 and 10 in the upper strata of spiritual, excuse me, spirituality in the future. And they say at verse 11, now we begin to pray for ourselves. So the first half we're worshiping God. The second half we're praying for, her, for ourselves. I do not make that distinction because there are two kinds of bread. Now I have this on the handout for you, letter B, two kinds of bread, heavenly and physical. Jesus was concerned about the physical. He fed the 4,000. He fed the 5,000. He had compassion upon them. I believe when Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread, he's talking about a provision of food. Or, you know, something to eat. Why don't we pray that way anymore? 
Because it's too easy. We've been used to earning our own money, buying our own bread, and making it, cooking it, and eating it. We don't give it another thought. Now you go to other countries where it's where food is not readily available and you're digging in the ground for it, it's a different thing. But most of us in the West have sort of forgot about praying for that. And here's the problem. When you forget to pray for the physical, you forget to pray for the spiritual. When you forget to pray for the physical, you forget to pray for the spiritual. I don't have to say a whole lot about the physical. Let me dwell for a moment on the spiritual. It's number two under letter B. There is a physical hunger and a spiritual hunger revealed in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and they shall be satisfied. Blessed are you when you hunger and thirst for righteousness, so we will be satisfied. As we need daily physical provision, we need daily spiritual provision. Matthew chapter 16, I've got verse 11 there. Let me turn to it for a second. Uh, This is very powerful. And the disciples came to the other side and had forgotten to take bread with them. Matthew 16, verse 5. And uh, disciples were slow on the uptake. You know that? (laughs) Jesus would, you know, they were always, can you explain this to us? We're not sure what you're saying. And Jesus said to them, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I'm reading out of Matthew 16, verse 6. So they began to discuss amongst themselves and said, is this because we forgot the bread? We forgot to put the bread in the boat. We took off without the bread. They're thinking physical. So many times we think physical and we don't think spiritual. One of our brothers on Friday said, I, you know, I had a dream, but I, you know, it was pretty wild and I, I, don't, I don't think it has any kind of meaning to it. And we asked that brother to share what the dream was with the group on Friday. As soon as he shared, everybody in the room, whoa, that's a prophetic dream. Went right over his head. But often that happens. If we don't stop and ask God to reveal to us or give us the daily portion, like the physical bread, give us the daily portion of his spirit. I need a daily portion of the Holy Spirit, an infusion of the Spirit every day in my life. The psalm that I have quoted on the bottom right, the morning prayer, give ear to my words, O Lord, Psalm 5, consider my meditation, give heed to my voice and my cry, my King, my God, for to you I will pray my voice, you shall hear in the morning. So if, if you're praying the Lord's Prayer in the, in the night, you'd be thanking God for His provision. If you're praying for the, in the morning, you're praying that He would pour out His provision. Back on Matthew 16, verse 8, and Jesus, aware of this, said, You men of little faith, why do you discuss amongst yourselves? Because you have no bread. And then verse 11 that's on your handout How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? What's the point in this? The point is that Jesus is saying that sometimes we're so connected into the physical, we miss the spiritual. Oftentimes when we read the word, we're just reading it you know, to get through our daily reading. But God's trying to speak to us out of the word. He's trying to speak to us when we're driving around in our cars, wherever we are. The impression of the Holy Spirit comes upon us and we need to respond to that. The daily bread. I've had the privilege in our congregation, I've been here 27 years as the pastor of this little group, and 
I've met people in my life or I know people in my life who express this daily stuff. Billy Graham expresses it that he read the Psalms and the Proverbs every day of his life for almost 50 years. Psalms to reveal God, the intent and nature of God. Proverbs to reveal the nature and intent of man. If you know about God and you know about man, I mean, you got to step up on everybody else. Edith Cavish, who I mentioned frequently as a mentor to Judy and I, worked with Catherine Coleman, a wonderful lady, and she had coffee. I call her the coffee saint. She had coffee with Jesus every morning. And she spent time, and I saw her Bible after she passed away, and she has, a matter of fact, you couldn't hardly read the Bible. There's so much handwriting and notes in it, right? I see some of the Bibles of our saints that have passed on. They're amazing. A whole life story in a Bible. But she said, I have my time with Jesus and my coffee every morning, and I've been doing it for 40, 50 years. Some of you remember Marion and Dick Alf, who were part of our congregation for many years. Both of them are now with the Lord. Every morning or every evening, at least once a day, for 30 years, they broke bread and had communion every single day. These are the people that prayed for presidential candidates, prayed over pastors that started huge churches, these are the people that greatly affected this ministry in their giving, in their teaching, and in their example. Daily, daily, they broke bread and had communion. I didn't find out about that until just before they passed away. I knew they took communion once in a while. But every day? Oh, my word. Think of the power of the spiritual bread that comes from developing that kind of habit. Let me close with the passage I have, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 and 19 at the bottom of your, of your handout. What's your hunger level? One reason we don't pray for daily provision or physical bread is that we have become content with earning our bread. I've mentioned that already. Likewise, we run the risk of our faith becoming shipwrecked if we fail to appropriate a daily presence of God's kingdom. First Timothy, oops, I'm in John. How did I get over there? Um, First Timothy chapter 1. So it's a great chapter because it, it reveals that God's intent, his desires, that all all might be saved. It's a basic foundational truth of of what we believe and what we what we pray for. First Timothy chapter one, verse eighteen and nineteen. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you. But by them you might fight the good fight. Now, Pastor Darrell, in talking about South Coast Assembly this morning, he gave, he started to read some of the prophecies that were given over the church. I hope everybody in this room has had a prophecy given over you at one time or another. I'm not talking about somebody that's, that's into themselves and just giving you what they think, but I mean a, the true gift, the prophecy that's imparted unto you. Sometimes I prophesy over the entire congregation. It's a gift that God has used me with. So, and, and, and the prophecy, the, the word is prophetic. The word is prophetic as it's, as it's written, and it's prophetic in rhema as it's spoken into my heart. Paul goes on to tell Timothy in verse 19, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. One of the greatest hindrances to the moving of the Holy Spirit. Listen carefully. I'm not picking on anybody or pointing anybody out here or anywhere. 
I will say this is my experience. When there is sin in my life, when I'm not walking with the Lord, the flow of the Holy Spirit is quenched. God says don't quench, don't grieve. Two things about the Holy Spirit. Don't quench, don't grieve. Don't quench, don't put out the fire, don't grieve, don't get angry. Those two things shut the flow of the Holy Spirit in my life. Freely I receive, freely I give. And the, one of the reasons I don't pray for people because I don't feel worthy. Because I've got sin in my life that I've not dealt with. There's people I haven't forgiven. There's all kinds of things that creep into our lives that, that check the flow of the power of God. That's why Jesus, I think, says daily you need to be confronted with this stuff so that your faith increases and that your conscience is pure. When your faith increases and your conscience is pure, you're released to pray heaven down on the people that are around you and the circumstances that are around you. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you today for that which you would teach us about prayer. I pray for each person here that you would give them an infusion of a heavenly call that you've called them to do and to be. You would release that into their lives right now. We pray, Lord, that you would increase healing within our congregation. You release the gifts of the Spirit on our congregation. You release salvation within our congregation. Pray, Lord, that you would purify us now by the power of your Holy Spirit.